It's my pleasure to uh, welcome everyone to the 27th season of our CC Crate Lecture Series. Uh, tonight is the first one of our 2022 series, and we are very, very happy that you are joining us. We were obviously hoping to be able to host a good number of you in our auditorium on campus and continue to stream uh, through the internet uh, the, those uh, presentations. But uh, unfortunately, our not so good friend COVID has decided that uh, it will be different and uh, it's going to be a remote uh, location for everybody, very, very unfortunately. We do hope, however, that uh, for the continuation of this series, we will be able to get back into a hybrid mode with a, a good number of people on campus and uh, continue the attendance also on the virtual streaming. Uh, with the uh, uh, start of our CC Crates, okay, which is our most important public outreach initiative for the school, we are extremely thankful for our sponsors, without whom this series would not be possible. And it's a remarkable and very appreciated that for the past 27 years, uh, we have been able to get the support of uh, many of the sponsors. Among them, and for this year, we uh, owe a very special thanks to our presenting sponsor, the Bank of America, and as well as the Shepard Broad Foundation, Bill Galloway, Cheryl Gold, the Key Biscayne Community Foundation, the KB Life Enhancement Forum, John McCuffin Family Foundations, the William McKeehan Trust, and uh, Nicole and Myron Wang. This past year, for those of you that have followed us, uh, you might recall that uh, we uh, used mostly uh, presenters, speakers from the Rosenstein School that presented the four different strategic initiatives that uh, we have decided to focus on. And each one of those strategic initiatives focus on one of the major a challenge that the society is facing in the 21st century. Tonight, we are going to continue with uh, one of our uh, faculty uh, that is going to be uh, speaking about the Red Sea. Uh, this is uh, Professor Sam Perkis, who is also the chair of the Marine Geosciences Department in our school. Uh, Professor Perkis, uh, similarly to uh, the other faculty that uh, we have presented last year, offers opportunities in his laboratory to educate students and the grad and graduate students that eventually okay, will become the next generation of scientists and educators. The capability for us uh, to offer those opportunities to work in a lab like the one from Dr. Perkis is a through uh, scholarship. It is you know, very important in a private organization, a private university like ours, to be able to support all students, including the one that uh, cannot afford uh, to pay the tuition at, uh, at the private school. So this, uh, these type of scholarships are extremely important and certainly help uh, very talented students uh, to come and join us and work with us on amazing uh, pro, uh, uh, projects. Any of you interested to uh, support that mission, uh, please contact Jennifer Dillon and uh, you can find her uh, email address in the chat box. As it is a customary now, uh, we are also introducing before the main speaker of the evening, one of our, of our alum, and uh, this evening, it is my true pleasure to welcome back to the school, Dr. Kelly Jackson. Uh, Kelly grew up in uh, uh, up north of uh, Chicago in Illinois. In, 20, in 2000, she entered, in fact, the University of Miami with the Constance Well Done Scholarship for music and academic performance. So who said that we do not have interesting students, okay? Doing a, du a double major in marine science and geology, as well as a Bachelor of Arts in Music for violin. 
Uh, in the same year she was admitted uh, uh, to the, uh, sorry, in 2004, uh, Kelly received a Bachelor of Science, as I mentioned, a double major from our uh, school as well as the uh, Arts and Sciences. In the same year, she was also admitted to the master's program in the Division of Marine Geology and Geophysics at the Rosenstein School and received the American Institute for Marine Studies Graduate Fellowship. In 2008, Kelly was granted a Master's of Science degree in Marine Geology and Geophysics. And after that, uh, she continued uh, for her PhD under the supervision of Gregor Eberly that she received in 2017, uh, again, a PhD in Marine Geology and Geophysics. Kelly now is the Director of Environmental Sustainability at Ransom Everglades School, where she also teaches integrated science to sixth grade students and marine field research to students in grades 11 and 12. She founded, directs, and teaches a scuba diving program at the school, where she teaches beginner through dive master scuba certification to students and families in the school community. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dean Avasar, for that introduction. Welcome, everybody, to Sea Secrets. I hope you enjoy this evening. My time at Rosensteel were some of the best years of my life. I had so much fun and learned so much um, throughout my various degrees at University of Miami and the Rosensteel School. I had so many wonderful opportunities to travel the world. As you can see on my screen, I was very, very lucky to get to travel and do so much field research. The red stars indicate places I got to do my own research. Starting on the left, I got to do research in South Florida, in the Everglades in South Florida, looking at some Miami oolite as well, and a lot in the Bahamas for my dissertation research for my PhD. Over moving to the right of the screen in Sri Lanka and far right in the Solomon Islands in the Pacific. The yellow stars indicate other places I either got to go and help other people do field research or go to conferences or field seminars. And just incredible opportunities I'm so thankful to have had because of the many opportunities at Rosensteel. In 2004, for my master's research, I got to travel to Sri Lanka, as I said, and we went over there and documented the geologic impacts of the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. We looked at the sediments that were deposited. We also talked to the local population there about their experiences. And we were trying to figure out if it was the first time that it happened there and to see if we could find geologic evidence for past tsunamis. And in fact, we did. And we discovered the first real record of paleo tsunamis in that part of Sri Lanka in a lagoon there in southeastern Sri Lanka and documented a 55 year, 5,500 year uh, record of those tsunamis. In the Solomon Islands, I got to participate on an international tsunami survey team with scientists from various different countries and also local scientists from the Solomon Islands documenting the geologic impacts from the earthquake and tsunami that happened there, including this uplift you see. This is a coral reef that the people are walking on top of that completely lifted up vertically out of the water because of the earthquake and the seismic uplift that happened in the area because of the event. Closer to home, I've spent many years studying the Exumas in the Bahamas, southeast of where NASA is, if you've been there before. And one of the things I studied there with Dean Navasar is we study the impacts of Hurricane Irene uh, a category three hurricane. We did an aerial survey of the impacts of the hurricane by flying a helicopter over and taking over 23,000 photos to see what the impacts were. For my PhD dissertation research, we took cores both from a research ship from land. I mapped islands by spending summers there also with drone technology and basically put together a sea level curve. Uh, the last 500,000 years, but I really focused on the last interglacial, which is a period 125,000 years ago, a really 
interesting special time period in sea level history. And you know, some of my fondest memories at Rosensteel were really the people I met and got to work with, the other students, the visiting researchers, and of course, the many mentors and faculty that I got to work with and get to know over the years. And all these field seminars is a picture from a Death Valley field trip that I got to go on, all the different ship, um, coral reef trips we got to go on, that's the name of this ship. And of course, all my various mentors over the years who taught me so much. And, you know, all of these wonderful, wonderful colleagues and students and just so many, so many wonderful memories which prepared me for what I'm doing now, as Dean Aversar said, I am currently the Director of Environmental Sustainability at Ransom Everglades School, close by to Rose and Steel, over in Coconut Grove across Biscayne Bay. And what I'm doing currently is I'm trying to increase environmental sustainability initiatives at the school that we have two campuses, a middle school and an upper school, and in areas such as increasing our solar initiatives and trying to decrease our footprint on campus and trying to increase our climate education across the curriculum and working on increasing gardening on both of the campuses and involving the students in those initiatives. And so we have lots of projects in the pipelines and really in increasing recycling on the campuses and all sorts of things from, you know, from a facility standpoint all the way into the curriculum at all levels in grades six through 12. And um, I've also started a scuba diving program where I, I teach students how to scuba dive and their families and also faculty, which has been really fun and rewarding. And together with actually two other Rosenstiel alumni, um, we started a marine field research program where we are introducing juniors and seniors, grades 11 through 12, to research field techniques. It's an elective science course where we take them out and into the field and introduce them to field survey techniques, um, basic scientific scuba diving, uh, shark tagging, as you can see here on the lower right. And the kids love it. And it, it's really, really rewarding to see them. And so between the three of us, the other two faculty and myself, we're teaching them little bits of everything we learned at Rosensteel. And of course, just introducing them to Biscayne Bay and you know, getting them out on the water as much as we can. And more recently, because of all of the stuff I've been doing, one of the most rewarding experiences I've had is I had the opportunity to go to Glasgow last um, November to attend the UN Climate Change Conference COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland with one of my students pictured here, a 10th grade student. So I'd just like to thank everybody at Rasmus, you know, for making all these many experiences possible. Um, it's, it's just, it was a wonderful, wonderful time in my life, my master's and PhD. So thank you very much. I will always cherish all those memories. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. It's great to have you back at uh, Rosensteel. I am not saying that I would love to go back to uh, high school, but if I had to, this is definitely a place that I would love to be. It sounds like you have developed an amazing program over there. So thank you for everything that you do. And, and again, welcome back to Rosensteel. It's now my uh, true pleasure also to introduce uh, tonight's uh, speakers, Dr. Sam Perkis. Sam is a professor and chair of the Department of Marine Geosciences here at the University of Miami Rosenstein School. His research currently focuses on fundamental questions about the health and resilience of coral reefs. In particular, the role that spatial self-organizations uh, plays in their patternship and architecture. Uh, Dr. Perkis got his undergrad degree uh, in the UK and then his MS and PhD in, uh, at uh, VU uh, uh, in Amsterdam. I am comfortable saying that the U stands for University of Amsterdam. The V, I'm not going to even try, okay, to uh, say what uh, it represents or the acronym of which name it is. Uh, he got his uh, PhD in 2004 and uh, uh, then uh, joined uh, NOVA uh, in 2005, where he climbed us through the ranks and we recruited him at Rosensteel in 2016. In 2017, he became the chair of the department. Another interesting aspect from uh, uh, Dr. Perkis uh, is that he did not start uh, right away in academia. He was in fact a scuba diver uh, instructor 
and um, a rescue diver in the Red Sea uh, for a couple of years. So uh, certainly has a lot of experience with that uh, uh, location. Sam, all yours. Great, thanks very much, Ronnie. Let me uh, just uh, share my screen here and we can get going. All right then, well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I want to add a few thanks of my own to that of Dean Avisar, to the sponsors of Sea Secrets, and to in particular, Cheryl Gold, who invited me to give the talk, and it's a great honor, so thanks to Cheryl. And Cheryl, she introduced me actually to Myron Wang a few weeks ago, who shared with me some fantastic photos from his adventures in the Red Sea back in the 70s. So thanks to Myron, and also just a shout out to the damsel the uh, Digital Atlas of Marine Species and Locations uh, website that he runs through the Rosen Steel School. All right, none of the work that I'm going to be presenting this evening is done in isolation, and it's really a privilege to work with my team. So thank you to Hannah, and to Cece, and to Angelique, and to Art, Anna, and Alex, and finally to all of the sponsors that make this work possible. So the presentation is really going to be in two parts. The, it, the title is Beauty and Peril in the Red Sea, and the beauty will be concentrating on why the Red Sea is a very special place, ecologically and geologically, and I'll touch on why it's very special to me. And then the peril comes when we take a dive into the deepest parts of the Red Sea, and we look at some of the processes which are ongoing, where we're recognizing that there is a very su substantial risk of tsunami in the Red Sea Basin. And this was interesting to begin with, but it has become an ever more prescient considering what we're seeing on the news uh, occurring in Tonga just a few days ago and uh, the tsunami and the volcanic eruption which has happened there. And much as what I'm be, well, I'll be speaking about tonight uh, has um, uh, similarities and lessons to be learned to what's occurring in Tonga at the moment. So why is the Red Sea so special? Well, first of all, uh, geologically, it's unique on Earth. It's a very young ocean basin indeed and we call it a maritime rift. It's maritime because it's connected to the Indian Ocean and the deep Red Sea Basin is filled with seawater, of course. That's why we call it a sea. And it's a rift because literally the Earth crust is being ripped apart by the divergence of two tectonic plates. The African plate is heading towards the west and the Arabian plate here is heading towards the east. So it's a very unique example of the birth of an ocean. Given time, it'll open up to be a great ocean like the Atlantic or so. The Red Sea is also really important for our own culture and our own civilization. It lies central to an area we call the Fertile Crescent, which is demarked by the Tigris and Euphrates rivers over here in the east, the Jordan River and the Nile in the west. And it's in this area which is really has been a cradle for human civilization. It's where we see the first agriculture being formed, irrigation, and the invention of writing, the invention of the wheel, and also of glass. So the Red Sea is truly a very special place. From a geological standpoint, it's a mere baby. It starts to form over only 30 million years ago. That might seem like a long time, but it really isn't. And it starts by a movement of these two tectonic plates, creating a depression in the landscape, which then grows over the next 10 million years or so. So by 20 million years ago, we would have had a series of lakes uh, down uh, between this early sort of rift setting. The sea hasn't yet flooded in, that comes later. So if we go from 20 million years to the present time, gradually we establish this connection with the Indian Ocean between 10 and 4 million years ago. And the Red Sea only really takes place about, uh, only really takes shape to how we see it today a million years ago. And that might seem a long time if you're not a geologist, but you've got to keep in mind that in terms of the evolution of our own species, it's already 4 million years ago that we find the footprints of our earliest ancestors just to the south of the Red Sea in Tanzania. And as they are migrating out of Africa, at least when they're encountering the Red Sea between four and two million years ago, it's a much narrower basin than we see today. The, the Nile only forms a million years ago and modern humans in the final wave of migration out of Africa have to cross the Red Sea about 125,000 years ago. So 
what I'm trying to affirm to you is the Red Sea is really evolving on human timescales. That's how incredibly young it is. These processes give us a glimpse to how all the ocean basins are formed. And I'm gonna take you now back much further in time, all the way to 245 million years ago, when North America is still attached to Africa in the supercontinent that we call Pangaea, but a rift just like the Red Sea is starting to form and North America is pulling away and the North Atlantic is just opening up. And if we look at the North Atlantic 170 million years ago, it's in fact very similar to the modern day Red Sea, both in the, the length and the breadth of the basin and also the prevailing climate. So by studying the Red Sea, we can look back at the birth of the great oceans like the Atlantic and given time, just as the Atlantic continues to open up, so does the Red Sea. So with that, I think I have shown to you why this is such a unique place on earth and such an interesting place to work. As Dean Avasar said, my love of the Red Sea developed way ago back in the early 90s where I was living in a tent as a young man, you wouldn't recognize me, I'm sure, there I am in the foreground feeding my dog, uh, teaching scuba diving on the Egyptian coastline of the Red Sea, uh, just north of the Sudanese border here. It was really a time where I was growing up rapidly and I fell deeply in love with this arid desert landscape. There's something really evocative about how, how stark and arid the desert is and then you cross just into the ocean and you find some of the richest coral reefs on earth. And if any of you have had the opportunity to dive in the Red Sea, and I'm sure many have done, you can see these incredible underwater landscapes. The corals are as good as anywhere you will have the pleasure to visit. The seascape, the topography is amazing, and the diversity is just really mind boggling. As a scientist, we study the corals in the Red Sea because it makes a perfect natural laboratory because the sea um, straddles a long latitudinal gradient. So you have cool waters up in the north. In fact, the most northerly coral reef on earth is situated up at the top of Gulf of Aqaba here on the coastline of Israel, where the waters are relatively cool as compared to the very hot waters we get in the south. This gives us a perfect natural laboratory to study global warming and its effect on corals. Because as we move from the north of the Red Sea to the south, it's as if we're transiting in time along a gradient of the warming of the oceans. I could spend the entire Sea Secrets lecture talking about the corals of the Red Sea, but I'm not going to do that. I'm gonna take you on a dive into a much deeper area and report on some work that I had the privilege of participating in, facilitated by Ocean X. Ocean X is a philanthropic organization which operates an incredible research vessel. I'm going to show you that shortly. And the work was sponsored by NEOM. That's an entity which is tasked with developing and urbanizing the Saudi Arabian coastline of the Red Sea. They sponsored the project. And all of the yellow areas here are what we surveyed when we went on a six week expedition towards the end of 2020. So we covered the, the northern part of the Red Sea and up into the Gulf of Aqaba. It was a six weeks mission and we were looking at the oceanography, the biology and the geology of the basin using this absolutely incredible vessel, uh, the Ocean Explorer. And I want to take you on a quick tour of that because it really is a breathtaking ship. The first thing you notice is this incredible helicopter, which is hangered on the bow of the ship with its own dedicated helipad. If we come round to the back, you can see over the stern, a submersible is being launched. And I'll talk about that shortly. And out of the starboard side of the ship comes uh, an even more incredible uh, uh, machine. This is the remotely operated vehicle, a robot submarine that can go all the way down to full ocean depth. But as a scientist, a lot of what excites me about this vessel actually isn't visible, but is hidden beneath the waterline because on the bottom of the ship, there is an array of multi-beam echo sound sounders, state-of-the-art equipment for mapping the seafloor in three dimensions. So as a scientist, we would probably stop work around 11.30 at night, having curated all our samples, we would go to bed to catch some sleep, but the vessel would carry on sailing and mapping all through the night. So then as a science party, we wake up early around 4.30 in the morning and we see these beautiful sea 
seafed maps which have been acquired the night before. And we're looking at features on the sea floor which have never before been seen by human eyes. So for example, here we have a series of sea mounts and a deep ocean trench and an underwater mountain range. Very quickly in the morning, starting by about five o'clock, we have to start to plan the day's activities and how we're going to deploy these incredible assets on the ship. So we have two of those uh, Triton submersibles. They can go to one kilometer in depth. They each carry two scientists and a pilot. And we have the robot vehicle, the ROV, which is tethered to the vessel that can go all the way down to 6,000 meters. So a plan is quickly uh, come up with, a swift breakfast is grabbed, and then as a scientist, we walk down into the sub hangar in the bowels of the ship and we go across a gangplank and lower ourselves down into the submersibles. The hatches are closed and we start go to go through the day safety checks and pressurization of the system. And all the time this commotion is going on, you can feel the great vessel maneuvering beneath you as it starts to approach the dive site. As soon as the vessel is positioned, the submarines start to roll on these robotic trolleys out of the hangar through a great door that opens and out into the sunlight you go. This huge A-frame mechanism comes down, picks up the submersible and over the stern of the ship, there's a quick look around to check there's no chance of collision and then the dive commences. It's first down through the light, the lit zone of the ocean and then after a few minutes into complete blackness. Each one of these dives can last between eight and 11 hours. So you really are settling in for a day's work as you make your way to the seafloor. I want to report on a discovery that we made during a dive towards the end of this expedition when we were working in an area called the Tehran Straits, which is here. It's a really busy area in terms of shipping because any vessel which wants to transit from the Northern Red Sea up the Gulf of Aqaba towards Jordan or Israel in the north has to go through a very narrow shipping lane here. So it's a very sort of strategic and busy area. And there's also a lot of urbanization going on. There's Sharm El Sheikh, which is this premier dive resort and an, an Egyptian resort town on the Sinai Peninsula. And in the process of being built is the line on the Saudi Arabian coastline. This is a 170 kilometer long uh, city of the future, which will terminate here in the Straits of Tehran. And there's plans, though construction hasn't started yet for the King Salam Bridge project, which will be the longest maritime bridge, which will link the line in Saudi Arabia via Tehran Island and deliver uh, into Egypt, into Sharm El Sheikh. So it's a fantastic uh, place to work. And as, uh, because of all of this urbanization, there's a lot of scrutiny on the geological processes at play here. So we'd map the seafloor with the multi-beam uh, bathymetry. We're using the Ocean Explorer the night prior, and we'd got up early in the morning and we'd planned the dive. We were gonna dive the submersibles down into the Tehran deep to a full kilometer depth, we were then going to transit across the ocean floor to reach this precipitous wall. It's nearly a thousand meters high, which would bring us up to a terrace at 100 meters water depth. We were then going to sail the submarines to the south for a pickup by the vessel by, Jack by Jackson Reef uh, sometime later that evening. I was leading the dive and looking at the geology in the deep, and we'd started our transit up the wall. And we were just starting to get into the stage where you see the first light coming down from the surface. Of course, at full depth, it's pitch black, but now we just see the sunlight and we're entering a zone we call the mesophotic. It's here that we see the first evidence of corals growing uh, using sunlight for their life cycle. And we're coming up the wall and just starting to reach the terrace. At this point, I'm handing control of the dive to the biologist who's sitting next to me, who's interested in the uh, genetics and the distribution of these deep water corals. And so I was handing the science over to him and I was just starting to tuck into my sandwiches because all of this geology makes you very hungry indeed. We come up to that 100 meter terrace and we were faced with something which was totally and utterly unexpected. The submarine encountered this escarpment on the seafloor. It's about 10 meters high. You can see the submarine for scale here and it's about six kilometers long. There's, there's another view with the submersible a little bit closer in and a final view here. Here you can see that the, the escarpment is about 10 meters high. 
Immediately when I saw this, I realized that what we're looking at is a result of some tremendous or catastrophic geological force, which has broken the seafloor. You can imagine that the part of the seafloor that the submersible is sitting on used to be joined on to the part up here, which is now offset 10 meters above. The seafloor that the submarine is on is also withdrawn by, by a number of meters, uh, revealing this deep chasm, which we're sort of cautiously peering into with the submersible. It tells me something really catastrophic has happened. The first thing to understand is how did this happen and when did it happen? And this is where it has uh, so much benefit to be collaborating with a multidisciplinary team. I was working with Dr. Giovanni Ciamenti at the University of Bari. He's in Italy, and he's an expert on the corals and the sponges that you find growing at this depth. We started to examine the biotic colonization of the escarpment that we'd found, and two things uh, immediately are obvious. First of all, there's not very many corals and sponges living on it, meaning that it's geologically or ecologically really quite young, maybe just a few hundred years in age. The second thing we notice, which is probably as important, is there's no gradient to the colonization. That is, that this hasn't been a slow uplift and reveal of this escarpment. No, instead it's taken shape very rapidly in a single event, sort of still reaffirming that this is something catastrophic. And there's really two sort of likely candidates which could break the seafloor in this way. The first is what we've found here is the rupture of a fault line during an earthquake. That, we investigated that for, for a time, but in, we came to the conclusion that is in fact very unlikely. I don't need to go into the details, but to make uh, ruptures which are 10 meters high rely on faults which are very long indeed and too large to be sort of constrained in, in the Straits of Tehran. The second candidate for what we're seeing here is much more worrying indeed. And that is we're seeing the aftermath of an underwater landslide which started but then got stopped and hung up after a short distance. So what that means is this area of seafloor on which the submarine is sitting is starting to slide to the right and away into the abyssal depths of the Red Sea as a huge underwater landslide, as an avalanche. I can show you what I mean by that here on the multi-beam bathymetry. So it's up here on this terrace where we discover the escarpment. And what we're presuming, and I can show you on the right here in three dimensions, is this whole slope is starting to fail and fall down into the deep. That hypothesis really isn't that outlandish, actually. If you look at just a little bit to the north of where we discovered the escarpment, you see this scallop-shaped bite mark in the margin here, where a terrace used to exist, but it is now collapsed catastrophically. And all of the slope, which was up here as a terrace, is now deposited down into the deep. And indeed, if you take a dive where the black asterisk here is, you see these towering uh, field of boulders and rubble, which is all of that shallow water shelf, which has catastrophically collapsed into the deep sea. You can see the size of these blocks towering over the submersible below. So with that, we believe we understand our discovery and this escarpment is created by the beginning of an underwater landslide, the ground moved, the area the submarine is on slipped and downhill just by a few tens of meters and then got stuck and is now hanging precipitously above the abyssal depths of the Tehran deep. The next question we set to answer is when did this event happen? Well, to answer that, we took the manipulator arm for the submersible and we plucked rock samples from the face of the escarpment, and we then used radiocarbon dating to quantify their age. And they come in around between four and 600 years ago, this catastrophic movement of the seafloor occurred. Just like you're seeing in Tonga in the news, if you start to move the seafloor, you can start to create tsunami on the sea surface. And we knew straight away that such a large movement had the capacity to create a rather substantial tsunami when it occurred 500 years ago. So to look into that, I started to work with a collaborator, Steve Ward. He's over at UC Santa Cruz, and he's an expert at running simulations on how movements of the seafloor create tsunami. And I'm going to play the simulation to what we think happened 500 years ago. 
Let me just give you a little primer before I press play. We're going to see the movement of the seafloor over here on the Saudi Arabian side of the Tehran Straits. We're going to see a wave, tsunami wave, propagating out towards the Sinai Peninsula. This is where the town of Sharm El Sheikh is. And we're going to see the wave impact that part of the peninsula after only 60 seconds. There's going to be hardly any warning at all. And then the wave is going to progress north, impacting the Saudi Arabian coastline, and then up the Gulf of Aqaba towards Jordan and Israel. So here we go. Here's the simulation from what we think happened 500 years ago. There's the wave being formed. It's hitting the coastline of Egypt very quickly. And there the wave goes up the Gulf of Aqaba. Let me just play it one more time. The wave is formed, immediately hits Egypt, and away it goes. But look at the size of the wave. The numbers here are its size in meters. Up to 10 meters high this wave would have been as it inundated the coastline 500 years ago. Just compare that to what we're seeing in Tonga, where we think the wave is between one and a half to perhaps two meters high. So this is a very substantial wave indeed. The question is, though, did anyone notice it 500 years ago? Well, the coastline of the Red Sea at that time was the, uh, under the height of the rule of the Ottoman Empire. And alongside making incredibly comfortable couches, the Ottomans, they also kept very detailed records of goings on in the region. And so we started to look in, the, in these records from antiquity to see if there was any record of a tsunami occurring in the Straits of Tehran in the southern reaches of the Gulf of Aqaba. And the answer to that, unfortunately, was no. There is, it's, this tsunami seems to have eluded the historical record. Actually, that might not be so surprising. So we're looking here at an uh, old map dating back to 1869. And what it shows us is that the modern town of Sharm el Sheikh, whereas that's situated in the Straits of Tehran, the, in antiquity, the town was actually much further to the South is for fishermen pre-1770. So this was a really deserted part of the coastline, and perhaps it's unsurprising the tsunami have ended up eluding a historical record. The question is, though, is there any geological evidence for it? Well, the answer to that is a yes, and we found it while diving about 70 kilometers to the north in a much deeper dive, more than a mile down, using the robot submersible, the ROV. We weren't looking for evidence of tsunami the time we were hunting for brine pools. This is a, an incredible geological phenomena where you get very dense salty water leaking out of geological formations beneath the seafloor and that brine then accumulates in depressions on the seabed forming underwater lakes. And I had a hunch that we would be able to find brine pools up here in the Gulf of Aqaba. They'd never been discovered there before. So we prepared the ROV, and we decided to make a dive in the very deepest part of the Gulf of Aqaba, about halfway up, where the, depth, the water depth is more than two kilometers. We launched the ROV in the, the middle of this deep basin with the idea of running a transect towards the Saudi Arabian coastline and completing our hunt for the pools. So the vessel was positioned. And in this video, I'm showing you here how we prepare to make such a deep dive with the ROV. All of the systems are checked early in the morning on deck, the lights, the thrusters, the huge camera systems situated on the front of the ROV. And once the vessel is maneuvered into position, this huge 10,000 pound uh, machine is very gently lifted out of the hangar where it lives and over the side of the ship. And we start our descent to the seafloor. So deep is it when we're going a mile down it's going to take more than two hours before we reach the seafloor. So there's a lot of anticipation as that machine goes over the side and starts to go down first through the sunlit waters. And then later, we're going to go down into the dark and the lights are switched on. Of course, it's every uh, scientist's dream to hit the seafloor and straight away discover what you're looking for. But this day was not one of those days. We landed down at a mile depth and it's a completely barren, desolate, featureless, muddy seabed. I wasn't perturbed. I knew that we had eight hours to play with and we started our transect across this barren landscape and hour after hour after hour, there was nothing but a barren, muddy 
seafloor. We got to within 15 minutes of the end of the dive. We had to then call it and the whole thing would have been scrubbed. We couldn't have come back again. We were out of time. And I've got to say, I felt incredibly guilty. I had dedicated this huge, amazing research vessel for discovering a brine pool and I hadn't managed to bring it home. We had just 15 minutes left of the dive. And to tell you the truth, I was so despondent. I said, we should lift the ROV. Let's get it back on deck and everyone can have their dinner. But the operator said, no, we're here. We're going to push on for the remaining 15 minutes. And with two minutes yet to go, this is what comes into view in front of the ROV. We see this underwater lake. This is the dense, salty brine. Don't forget, we're more than a mile down here at the bottom of the sea. And this initial small brine pool turns into something much larger. And the thrusters of the ROV start to move the brine and we get this very slow motion wave moving across the surface of this underwater lake. And I've got to say so far, it was the most exciting scientific discovery I've been involved in. We immediately lowered down instrumentation from the ship a mile above down into the brine pool to sample it. And we confirm it's completely devoid of oxygen. It's hypersaline. It's a very, very unpleasant uh, sort of environment. Indeed, any animal that enters the brine will be immediately killed through asphyxiation. But there's a dense ecosystem which starts to develop around the brine pool. These are deep sea shrimp and any animal which falls into the brine is, and is killed, these shrimp swim out across the surface, of course, being careful not to dip themselves in and start to scavenge the dead out of the pool. So it's a very rich ecosystem in an otherwise rather desolate abyssal environment at a mild depth. It's not just the shrimp that we find, we found this, uh, this uh, fish, probably due to science, my colleagues in Italy are looking at it now, which is also hunting on the brine surface in complete darkness, delicately pulling out any animals which are stunned and killed by the brine. And look what an incredible beast it is. Even though it's been pitch black, it has these lovely eyes with the gold around them and the blue iridescence of its fins. So this was really a great discovery. It was the first brine pool ever seen in the Gulf of Aqaba. And we are interested in brine pools because arguably they re represent the most extreme habitable environments on Earth. It's these dense microbial communities living without oxygen in this hypersaline environment at the bottom of the sea. And there is nowhere more hostile to life, but still it persists. Indeed, so hostile is life around the brine pool, it might offer clues to life on other planets. And the microbes that have been sampled from these environments yield bioactive molecules which seem to have uh, incredible properties for dis curing diseases and in particular anti-cancer properties. I have a undergraduate student, Hannah Shaninsky, who's leading the evaluation of the microbes and you can see the beautiful gold color of the microbial mats here on the brine pool and she's taking samples and we took them here from the submarine and they come back to Miami and Hannah's looking at the genetics and making all sorts of strides about life in this incredibly inhospitable environment. Well, I wasn't here for the microbes. I promised you that we were gonna find evidence for a tsunami. And to do that, I had to persuade the pilot of the ROV to land the machine so it was floating on the top of the brine. It was a very risky maneuver. It took a lot of persuasion, but we landed it on the brine surface and then we pushed a pipe down through the brine using the manipulator arm here into the seafloor beneath the brine to, to sample the sediments which have been accumulating over the last thousands of years. So we pushed the pipe down and here you can see us pulling it back up through the brine surface. Back to the surface and back to Miami. We then take that pipe and we first scan it with a CT scanner, much like you'd be scanned in a hospital so we can understand what's going on inside it. And when we're comfortable, because we only have one shot at this, we cut the pipe in half and we split the core that we've retrieved and how beautiful it was. It covers the last 1200 years or so of sedimentation into the brine pool. And there's two things that jump out at you. The first is the beautiful lamination, the very intricate layers you see. The reason that they're so well preserved in the brine pool is though animals can get into the sediment because there's no oxygen there. So all of the clams and the worms and the shrimp that would usually 
disturb or biotabate the seafloor, they're excluded from the brine pool, so we get this exquisite record. The second thing that jumps out at me from the core are these golden colored sand lenses and the chemical composition of that sand tell us that it has not come from the ocean. This is sand which has somehow been swept out of the coastal plain and the desert surrounding the Gulf of Aqaba. And we had a hunch we knew what it was. The, uh, the younger sand lens at the top of the core dates to the mid nineties. So it's quite recent, which corresponds to a major earthquake which happened just across the other side of the Gulf of Aqaba and nearly destroyed the town of Nueva in 1995 and generated a modest tsunami. We hypothesize that that tsunami swept sand out of the desert into the deep Gulf of Aqaba, which became preserved at the bottom of the brine pool. The next sand lens dates to around 1750, which is also the time of a major earthquake in antiquity, which recorded 40,000 fatalities, apparently. It's called the Cairo earthquake. And it, right down at the bottom of the core, one of the deeper sand lenses here corresponds to 1068, where we know from um, historical writings that there was a major earthquake and 20,000 fatalities in that case. So it seems that these sand lenses are recording earthquakes and likely the tsunami that they generate. And most fascinating of all, the largest sand lens of, uh, in the core dates to 500 years ago, which is when we think the tsunami was produced down near Sharm el Sheikh and propagated up towards the north. And we believe we've found the evidence we, we, we were looking for. 500 years ago, it seems that this event didn't afflict much damage. The area was unpopulated, but that is not the case now. We have the bustling town with hundreds of thousands of people of Sharm el Sheikh and the Sinai Peninsula. And in a few years from now, when the line, this futuristic city is built, there's gonna be millions of people living in it. And here is an artist's impression of how the line will terminate on the Straits of Tehran. So you have to ask yourself, that now that this landslide has started, but has got hung up for some reason, what's going to happen if that entire slope fails to completion, just like it has slightly to the north at some time in the future? And it's not unlikely to occur. We have a lot of movement of geologic faults, and we have a lot of earthquakes in the region, which could persuade this landslide to slide to a complete failure. How big would the tsunami be? Well, we went back to Steve Ward, in UC Santa Cruz, and we set up a simulation where we allow a complete failure of that Saudi side of the Straits of Tehran, and this is the tsunami that's produced. You see the wave hits Egypt again very quickly in less than a minute, and the wave is up to 30 to 40 meters high as it starts to head up the Gulf of Aqaba towards Jordan and towards Israel. So this would be a very major event indeed. Just think what we're seeing coming out of Tonga, which is utter devastation, incredibly frightening, is wrought by a, a wave which is one to two meters high. And we think there's potential for a wave here, which is tens of meters high. It really is very concerning indeed. So it seems that the geological processes which deliver the beauty of the Red Sea and this rugged coastline and the high mountain peaks also carry with it danger. There's frequent earthquakes, and it seems that there's potential to generate very large tsunamis in this basin, and they've happened before, and they'll likely happen again. So in conclusion, I've shown that the Red Sea is a young ocean. It allows us a glimpse into the ancestral Atlantic as it would have looked 170 million years ago. I've shown you that this rifting process which creates oceans is episodically violent, it's prone to generating strong earthquakes and tsunami. And whereas the coastline of the Red Sea was sparsely populated in antiquity, it's urbanizing very rapidly at the moment, particularly the coastline of Saudi Arabia. And there's geohazards implicit with this young ocean basin that need to be recognized and they need to be planned for. Tsunami represents a unique risk because the basin is so narrow, narrow if you form a tsunami on one side, it hits the other side very quickly, leaving little time for early warning and little time for the wave to dissipate. So slope failures in the Red Sea are especially hazardous. Even minor fail failures can generate very large tsunami. And the brine pool that we found is the first seen in the Gulf of Aqaba. It was really a very exciting moment to discover it. It hosted exceedingly rich microbial fauna, showing us how life can be at its most extreme on planet Earth and perhaps beyond our Earth and beyond our solar system. 
being hypersaline and devoid of any oxygen, the bed of the brine pool is spared the disturbance of bioturbation by shrimps and clams and worms and so, as you find elsewhere. And that gives us this incredibly exquisite record uh, of sedimentation. And we see the record of past earthquakes and we believe past tsunami. And it seems that you should expect about one event every hundred years, at least over the last millennium. So with that, I want to thank all of my collaborators very kindly indeed. Matty Rodrigue was the chief scientist on the mission and she led a great trip with an excellent team. I want to thank all of my colleagues in the Department of Marine Geosciences who have been working with me on this. I want to thank Ian Enox and his team over at NOAA who helped us use the CT scanner on the core before we cut it and my collaborators in Germany and Saudi Arabia and in Italy and many others beyond. Thank you so much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. That was amazing, super interesting. And uh, having uh, had the opportunity myself to dive in the 70s in that area, I appreciate okay, every word that you are saying about it. It's a beautiful, amazing uh, uh, area indeed. Um, we are going to take the time to answer some of your questions, but just before that, I would like again, you know, to thank you, obviously, and uh, everybody that is participating in this series. And uh, please uh, recall that on February 8, we are going to have another uh, C Secret uh, lecturer uh, that's going to be Edith uh, uh, Wither, that is going to be speaking on deep sea exploration and the giant squid. And uh, right now, uh, let me open that for questions. And my colleagues at the Rosenstein School are going to be taking and, uh, those questions for you. So thanks, everybody. And uh, thanks again for participating. And now is the time for questions. Hi, Sam. Are you ready? We have several that have come in. And um, one of them I wanted to read right now were, has, have there been any more brine pools discovered in the region since the discovery of the uh, NEOM brine pool? Uh, no, there's been, there's been no, um, there hasn't been any discovery since 2020. Uh, there is a plan for OceanX to go back to the Red Sea, and I'm sure that's going to be on their list. But now that we recognize they're in areas like the Gulf of Aqaba, it could be that there's many more brine pools than you, we previously estimated in these sort of environments. So nothing yet discovered, but you know, everything to play for in 2022. All right. Um, what can be done to mitigate the tsunami hazards along the rapidly urbanizing Red Sea coastline? We've had lots of questions about that. Well, I, I mean, th this is very difficult. I mean, I, I think the first thing is to recognize that there is a hazard and not ignore it. I mean, um, there are ways, of course, setting up monitoring networks to uh, start to um, listen for earthquakes, because of course, the, the complete failure which would, of that margin, which would generate a tsunami in the future might be accompanied by an earthquake. It doesn't have to be, but it probably would be. So having a, a really sophisticated earthquake monitoring network and buoy situated out in the Red Sea in the Gulf of Aqaba to detect the tsunami. The problem is of course, is that there's a very short uh, time of warning because the Red Sea is so narrow, you know, just a minute or perhaps two minutes at most. And so I think then you have to think about where you're going to place your critical infrastructure and have evacuation routes and so on and so forth. But certainly humans, you know, live in areas with tsunami risk and there are ways of mitigating it, but it's never going to be as safe as living somewhere where there isn't a tsunami risk. I suppose a good analog is living with earthquake risk, as millions of people do along the San Andreas Fault. It's a great place to live. You just have to respect the risk and do your best to prepare for it and give early warning. Great. What was this? Do you know the species name of the predator that lives in the brine pool? It was a flat, pale, triangular head, eyes like a flounder? Well, it probably is a, a type of flounder, but we think it might be new to, to science. And so um, it doesn't have a species name yet, but I will tell you a secret. If it is new to science and they name it Perkisai after me, I have promised to get it tattooed on my arm. So in some ways, I'm hoping it isn't uh, new to science because that might've been a check that I never wished to cash. 
But uh, no, we're still looking into exactly who that fish is, and we have genetic material and checking it against databases. All right, it's, it's well known that the effects of climate change ravage coral reefs. Is the deep sea sim similarly af afflicted? Well, that's a, that's a really excellent question. And the answer to it is probably the deep sea is similarly afflicted, but we just don't understand to what extent because it's so difficult to work in the deep sea. And I think it's very important going forwards that as we think about conserving the shallow ocean, which we should absolutely do and to preserve biodiversity wherever possible, we must also concentrate in the deep. And whereas, you know, a quick cursory look in the deep, deep Gulf of Aqaba would have shown a sort of barren, desolate seafloor, there's these hotspots of biodiversity like the brine pools we discovered, which really are deserving of conservation. Awesome. So someone asked, is, are the brine pools extremely acidic or poisonous? Well, they, uh, their, their pH is different from seawater, so they're slightly acidic and they're poisonous in the sense that there's no oxygen. So, you know, anything which enters into the brine by accident, and we saw animals doing it, you know, they immediately asphyxiate and die. And so, um, you know, it's not poisonous in the sense that it's sort of poisoning their systems. It's just that they're asphyxiating and they die instantly. I mean, it's amazing. You see a shrimp when it's hunting across the brine surface, if it gets it wrong and dips in for just a couple of seconds, I'm afraid that's it. Wow, is there, is there any evidence suggesting that tsunamis events may trigger further underwater landslides? Well, that's, that's also a good question. And it's quite, it's possible, you know, that a tsunami would because it, it leads to a lot of commotion at the coastline and that can trigger things going on in the deep ocean. For example, if you wash a lot of material out from the coastal plain onto the coastal shelf, that may add that little bit of extra weight, which is enough to cause the shelf to fail. So it's, it's not impossible, but um, typically the tsunami is generated in one of two ways, either by an earthquake and a rupture of the seafloor, or like we've just seen in Tonga, by a collapse of the seafloor. It seems that sometime after that initial explosion, the caldera of the volcano has collapsed and that's propagated the tsunami. Just as in the Red Sea, the seafloor started to collapse and that pushed the tsunami out away, sort of like a giant paddle. So that's the typical way that we form them. Thank you. Somebody asked really early on, it says, how, how did you determine it was in fact 500 years ago? Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. So with that, we took samples out of the escarpment and we can date them here in Miami using radiocarbon techniques. So using radioactive uh, forms of carbon and we know how quickly that decays and we, we can date the corals which were broken when the seafloor ruptured. And with that, we can start to get a good idea of when it happened, which as I say, pitched it to around 500 years ago. Thank you so much. We had, we had so many great, great questions here. I think, um, do we think we have one time for one more question? I, would, I wanted to know, somebody's asking about the, uh, the sampling outside of the brine pool. Does it show the same sedimentation? Well, it, it does. So if you, go, if you go away from the brine pool, you get the same sediments accumulating on the seafloor. But the trouble is, uh, through time, they become overturned and disturbed by all of the deep sea organisms, benthic organisms that live you know, on the seafloor. And I said that mostly worms and shrimp and clams and all of those things, they chew through the seafloor at an incredible rate, actually. They're excluded from the brine pool because there's no oxygen. So they can't get, they can't access that part of the seafloor. And that's where we see the exquisite record. So it's the same sediments outside, but they're badly mangled and much harder to interpret. Thank you so much. I think we're, we're almost out of time. And if you would want to catch all of this, we have, we'll have this uploaded to our YouTube channel. You can follow us at UMiami, uh, R-S-M-A-S, Rasmus, on YouTube. This will also be posted to our Facebook and you'll receive a follow-up email with the links to the lecture as well. Join us on uh, February 8th for the second lecture of our 2022 Sea Secrets Lecture Series with Edie Witter. And it's gonna be uh, Here Be Monsters, Exploring the Edge of the Map. And with that, we wanna thank everybody for attending.